Dan, morning. How are you, man? Doing well, man. It's been a long time. <laughs> Has it? Feels like it's been like a few weeks. Well, it's crypto years. I mean, a month is like yeah. a year, and you know, it's it's uh, <laughs> what, what has <laughs> happened in the last in the last month. I mean, there's probably been like at least a couple dozen narratives that have come and gone. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I didn't think of it like crypto years. Yeah, I've aged a lot since we last spoke then. Right. Good to have you back. Good to have you now as a regular guest. We're going to do some good shit uh, together. But for this first one, I want to get you back. I wanted to revisit the super cycle stuff with you. So it's funny. Since um, I text you, since we'd made that show, I keep seeing it pop up everywhere. Super cycle this, super cycle that. It's the whole narrative has now been embedded into the conscious consciousness of people. Like it keeps coming up. Um, and I kept thinking, I was like, I was trying to th- like think to myself, what, what, is this like, d- did you come up with this yourself or was this like something you saw elsewhere? I, I kind of want to land that first. <laughs> yeah. So like, I'm not a huge fan of like putting my, my flag in the ground and being like, oh, I found this first. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people have talked about a bigger cycle. I think I might've been the first one to say super cycle though. So I actually shit. brought this up. A lot of people think that I came up with a super, super cycle theory in December, which was when I revisited it um, in uh, my the Help Report newsletter. But I actually wrote about this back in 2019. And, um, right. and you can actually search this on Twitter. So if you search super cycle Dan Held, you'll find it back in 2019. And it was predicated on the theory um, and some of the insight that Ray Dalio has around long-term and short-term debt cycles. Mm -hmm. So essentially there's these mini cycles and you've got bigger macro cycles. And when those waves converge, that could yield very strange environments for the economy, very strange uh, environment for the, for, um, for the markets. And with Bitcoin, we've got a micro cycle, which is the four year halving cycle Mm -hmm. combined with a macro cycle of COVID. Um, And at the, in 2019, when we looked at 2020 and 2021, we were due for a typical recession, which is our typical macro uh, macro cycle. And uh, we didn't see that happen. What we saw is something even bigger than that, which was a you know full-on pan, one out of a 100-year pandemic uh, or once in a 100-year pandemic. And that, I think, do- kind of doubly reinforced that the super cycle was a legitimate kind of real theory because we had had that moment in the macro environment that was so so crazy and so different that it, it truly kind of yielded a a, a proper footing for a, a super cycle to begin. It's so funny you should say that. I should show you my notes after this because I've got here, I've got what is the super cycle? And I've got, because I only watched it the other day, I've got, reminds me of the Ray Dalio, how the economic machine works because uh, I'd seen it before about a year ago. It's one of those things I should probably watch every few months. I'll put it in the show notes for anyone listening. But uh, I've got it that it reminds me of that. Uh, and I've put the long debt, the long term debt cycle was lining up with the Bitcoin halving cycle. So I'd kind of observed something similar. Um, but before we get back into this, I, I don't know if everyone, well, everyone wouldn't have heard the previous show we we made. I'll put that in the show notes as well. People should go and hear that. I do. I did just want to set up beforehand, though. I just want to be really careful. I, I want to explore the super cycle with you, but I also want to be clear: like this is a theory. Like people should not hang their hats on this as some kind of certainty because it's just a theory. It might it might not happen. It might fail. We might have another drawdown like previous years. Um, and it reminds me of that whole, I do remember the whole meme from the last cycle, the 33K by July and people were holding out for that. And then January we dumped and we went into a bear market. And I, 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 I was sucked into that. So I just, I just want to like set that up. That it's important to say that. Yeah, I think that's a great caveat before we begin. This is not a prediction. This is merely describing that there are multiple outcomes to a bull run. This is one possible outcome. And the reason why we're talking about it today and that people are latched onto the theory, some folks thought that I came up with this right in the middle of the bull run. No, I came up with this in the bear run, in the bear market, which meant that, you know, I felt this way a long time ahead of this whole bull run before sentiment shifted. So that's where I'm describing a a very bullish outcome that no one else at that time was even considering, even remotely considering. So that's where again this is this is just describing how an outcome might look like there. I am not saying that this is likely or that this is going to happen, but it could. 
But we're observing it in case it does happen. <laughs> Just in yeah, case. Yeah, we, uh, well, it's, I think it's possible. And most yeah. people back in 2019 considered me to be a lunatic. I mean, they're like, this, there's no way this is possible at all. And I'm like, well, it's possible. And they're like, no, it's not even possible. So I think, I think that's a level step in terms of how close we might be to this potentially happening. Well, I released a show with uh, Pete Rizzo yesterday. Uh, it was called The Last Days of Satoshi. And during the interview, we talked about it. And he's just, he's just like, no, there's no super cycle. No super cycles happening. We're going to see the same drawdown we've seen in every other bear market. And I was like, hmm, again, I'm not too sh- I couldn't say that with any certainty either. Um, so I, I just think it's important to set that up. I just want to warn people because I know what'll happen. Some people are like they'll get to like February, and if there isn't, they'll be like, "Where's my super cycle? I've lost loads of money. It's all your fault. I leveraged my house." Go fuck yourself. Totally. You know? <laughs> well, I've I've been mentioning the super cycle since Bitcoin was less than ten thousand dollars, so I <laughs> I think you're up in the green no matter where where you got in during the cycle. Um, but yeah, I, I think that a lot of people view it with skepticism initially. You know, they're like, "This is this is a crazy theory." Um, but for us to believe that it would be a normal cycle is similarly, I would say, a little bit wild. Like for us to believe it will be a typical cycle, that means that we need to ignore all qualitative information that we're seeing. That the that the world had a, a pandemic, that governments printed twenty five trillion dollars um, in dollar equivalent value. Um, we have to ignore all of this and be like, yeah, it'll just be the same as the other ones. And we'll we'll dive into that a little bit later. But you know, mm-hmm. I find that equally hard to believe that nothing would change with this cycle. I yeah, maybe the maybe the super cycle is wrong, but it certainly isn't wrong in the, in regards to it's gonna be different. I mean, I don't know how it could be the same given how much is different about the markets. Mm. Okay. All right. So let's let's just get into a few things first. Uh as a reminder, we did the show before. Some people won't have listened to it. I'll be surprised, actually. That's one of, my, one of my top shows ever. But um, if they haven't listened, just as a reminder, what is a super cycle like in your mind? I know you talked about uh, the Ray Dalio video, um, but what itself is a super cycle? What are we looking out for here? Yeah, so I would define a super cycle as a cycle that either has a more intense bull run or a very... Um, very weak bear market. Market. So essentially, we could see Bitcoin, if the very hyper bullish scenario, we would see Bitcoin go past what everyone is predicting is two hundred, like a hundred thousand to three hundred thousand dollar final price in this bull run. Everyone's saying that, right? And when everyone yep. says something, I'm like, it's typically not going to do that. If we're all predicting it to do this one thing, it might not do that. Um, so a, a hyper bullish scenario, a super cycle scenario, would have Bitcoin hit like a million in this bull run, mm-hmm. which seems just crazy, right? It just seems really out there. And that's why I'm describing it as a potential scenario because I think there is a potential for it to happen. So it could hit a million or something like that. So it kind of blow past all of the commonly agreed upon. If you like look at the average peak analysis, it's like 100 to 300,000. So this blows past that number to some degree. Um, and then you've got the other yeah, element, Dan, which is... The- Dan, the funny thing is about that million dollar thing, right? We don't expect it to happen, but if it did happen, you you wouldn't be like, you wouldn't be hugely surprised. You'd be like, "Well, it's Bitcoin, right?" <laughs> okay, it did it. Yeah, I mean, Bitcoin has these crazy asymmetric moves. Mm-hmm. People are like, "Oh, it's totally logical. Bitcoin could go to a hundred to three hundred thousand. And I'm like, "Well, three hundred thousand is just three x more as a million. You know, like that sort of movement for Bitcoin it isn't out of the realm of possibility. Um, so, yeah, I think that. People are like, okay, it's going to fall between this range. But yeah, it could blow past the commonly accepted range of, of highs um, and go past that. And then conversely, the bear market might be a much less cold winter. Um, and we can delve into the reasons of those, but that would be that would be the price movement that I would define as a super cycle. Or what we could see is what if the price goes up and we print 100 to 300,000 and it goes flat? Mm-hmm. Like, what if it goes flat for a couple of years? Like, people are like, oh, for sure there'll be a bear market. I'm like, I don't know. What if it's a very mild winter? Um, they, you know, everyone predicts, oh, it has to have the same 80% drop from the last bull runs. I'm like, maybe, but there's a lot of things that are different with this, uh, with this cycle. Yeah. So I guess what you're saying is if we went into a bear market 
but say you know say we printed 300 at a top and say if we bounce somewhere between like maybe 2 220 and 300 like in that kind of range like that 30 percent you will still consider that super cycles we haven't hit that kind of 80 percent drawdown situation yeah i would say the super cycle is in either or scenario or both uh where we have a yeah. more intense bull run than expected or a less cold winter yeah, because you're not going to get both. If you if you print a million dollars, you're probably going to see quite a significant. <laughs> if we drop print a million there. and then there's a it goes it goes horizontal for the next couple of years, that'll be that'd be crazy. I mean, yeah, it's certainly possible, but that sort of price movement would be, you know, I, I would estimate, you know, there should be a, a pretty intense drawdown from that sort of intensity. Yeah, it depends how many dip buyers there are and who the dip buyers there are. It depends what new entrants we have in the market. Okay, okay, so. I guess then the the time frame you're looking at is uh, if we have a more intense bull run, it's between here and the end of the bull run, which could be, let's give it a broad range of between November and February-ish. That's like a good catch-all for all scenarios. And then the drawdown probably over between now and say, you're looking probably mid-2024 is when we tend to see yeah, I mean these. Let's yeah. see what what is the average post post high? It's like um, two two and a half year. Yeah, bear market. So sometime in twenty three twenty four, we see the low printed. Yeah. Sometime between late twenty one and twenty three, we kind of see this theory validated or invalidated. Right. Okay. So an invalidate. So let's do the flip. I won't answer for you. You tell me what the invalidation signals are. I would say we hit uh, invalidation signal would be we hit. That predicted range, one hundred to three hundred thousand. So it hits that, and we draw down eighty percent, like every other every other cycle. I would say that would be kind of defined as like a the model has been rejected, like this this super cycle did not occur. Yeah. Um, or we might, you know, people. <laughs> I don't want to be bearish, and I'm not bearish, but we could see us not even hit a hundred thousand. <laughs> That's also possible. You know, mm-hmm. I, I don't think it's plausible. But it's certainly out of a spectrum of all potential outcomes. It's a possible one. That would also be a rejection of the super cycle, uh, obviously. Uh, what about this scenario? What about we don't hit 100 or we tap 100, but we go into next year, into 2022, and we see, you know, again, con- some continual gradual growth? That kind of yeah, scenario. That's a, good, that's a good question. I mean... I mean that would fit the definition of a of a very light or moderate bear market. Um, yeah, I mean that that's kind of interesting as well. Like, what if you know if the hundred thousand, like if we don't hit a hundred thousand, but we hit eighty thousand and it goes sideways, that would certainly be interesting and go sideways until the next until the next four year cycle. You know, I guess that would fit the definition of a, a minor bear market. Yeah, because what I keep wondering is like you've probably thought about this, but every. Uh, Everyone is sharing the charts now, and they're laying the charts from previous years on top of each other. Everyone's kind of got this same expectation of what's going to happen. I don't remember the similar in 2017. I just don't remember that. Maybe it was. You know, maybe I was a noob, whatever. But I just don't remember uh, the charts being laid on top of each other because I guess you know it was uh, only two previous cycles. The first one was very early Bitcoin. So it was coming into a third one. Now it's kind of history has repeated itself twice this third time looks like it's repeating itself i just feel like who's going to front run who you know when they're looking to sell if historically we've had around 300 and then for by about december are people going to be front running others to sell out the market maybe you know looking to exit that's one of the things that just keeps crossing my mind well, that's what's funny about the markets is that there's this reflexivity to, or it's that's the classic uh, Keynesian beauty contest, is we're all repricing the market because of what we perceive everyone else to be repricing the market at. And uh, that's what's so funny about this, right? Everyone's pricing the market in that hundred to $300,000 range. And I'm like, well, what if what if that happens and then it starts to get repriced at 500 to uh, 800000 and then repriced again? And um, and then new narratives will be crafted as the bull run intensifies. Um, there will be new companies that get into Bitcoin. There'll be all these events that happen. And, and we look at the environment now and we're like, this feels implausible. But what happens when the narrative starts to move in the direction of your investment thesis? As it starts to reinforce that your investment thesis was correct, which makes people huddle harder. And so there's that reflexivity in the price as it gets closer to the event of like a super cycle. Like 
what happens if Bitcoin blows past 300,000? Do you think anyone's going to sell? Maybe. But then all of a sudden, the super cycle chatter becomes super, in, like really intense as the reflexivity of folks wanting a narrative that fits what the price is doing starts to kick in. We see this happen conversely, like Bitcoin dropped a few days ago. All the bears come out. All the bears come out and they're like, oh, it's the end of Bitcoin. Sell all your Bitcoin. We were right. <laughs> and then quickly the market rebounds and then boom, all the bears disappear. So uh, kind of a, a similar vein of that, as the bull market intensifies, the bullish narratives intensify, which creates a reflexivity of folks believing that these more implaus previously implausible outcomes. I mean, again, the super cycle came out in 2019. This was not a bullish year for Bitcoin. This was very bearish. And I want to make sure that the distinction is called out a couple of times because a lot of people think I came up with it in the middle of the bull run, which is easy to do because that reflexivity, everyone's like, oh, we're all bullish. This totally makes sense. No, I was, I was hyper bullish in the middle of a bear. Right. All right. So let's talk about Tesla. I've got it. Let's talk I've got about a, it. I've got an uh, interesting theory uh, about what happened uh, over the last week or two, but what we heard uh, about them selling off. What was it? Was it two hundred seventy-two million dollars of profit, but they sold off around four hundred million dollars of Bitcoin? I can't remember. Uh, approximately something like that. Yeah, something like that. Whatever. And um, uh, El Presidente, Mr. Dave Portnoy. Uh, gave Elon Musk a bit of stick, and Elon Musk came back and said, no, we were testing liquidity. Uh, and, and a few people quickly mocked him, including myself, um, with regards to this kind of statement. But I was thinking about this, actually. You know, if you're Elon Musk and you've invested $1.5 billion, I can't remember the price, but let's just say you're up a couple of billion dollars. Um, I think Elon Musk cares more about his business than Bitcoin. I think he cares more about his um, end goal with regards to all his companies than Bitcoin. Um, what if Elon Musk is spending a lot of time, or people within his team are spending a lot of time studying Bitcoin? What if they're studying previous market cycles? What if they're saying, look, we could get to the end of this year and this cycle could end and we could be sat on X number of dollars in Bitcoin. We should be thinking about we want to exit our position, whether it's part or their whole position. I don't know. I don't think Elon Musk particularly cares. I could be wrong. I, you know, I'm answering for him. But I don't think he really cares about how much Bitcoin he owns for the long time. I think he cares about how much runway he has for his businesses. So what if that is a liquidity test? Because he is looking. they are looking towards the end of the year, and they're thinking, well, look, Q2, we sell another stack. Q3, we sell another stack. And maybe we exit all, all a part of our position. I could be completely wrong. But what if that's what yeah, they're let's, thinking? Let's address a couple of things here. One, I find it a little bit annoying in the Bitcoin community where I'm like, look, I am the most hardcore hodler out there. I've been hodling in eight fucking years. <laughs> My last name is Held. I've gone through a lot of shit, right? Like I've gone through a couple of these cycles. It's a lot. It's a lot of mental fortitude, a lot of belief. I don't necessarily shame people for not having the exact same belief I do. I'm like, look, a lot of Bitcoiners went and bought a car the first time it mooned, or they, you know, like a Peter McCormick. <laughs> you know, they, 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 go buy, they go buy Lambos. Now, I, look, I find it very funny that Bitcoiners believe in, you know, freedom money, that you can go do whatever you want with it, but as soon as you do something they don't like with it, then they get mad about it. So, Well, let's not, let's you know, let, we, we, we're grouping all Bitcoiners. You were saying Bitcoiners here, and that's all of them. But let's say certain, certain Bitcoiners. Sure, yeah. sure. There's a certain Because you're, you're a Bitcoiner. You don't do that. Yeah, I'm a Bitcoiner, and I'm like, look, I think the narrative of saving, which Pierre Rochard has done, is a great narrative. Mm -hmm. People should look at saving versus consuming. You'll, you'll find more happiness and and saving for now, it's an altruistic thing. It's good for the economy. I think that is a beautiful narrative, and I, I very much welcome and embrace that. But at the same time, we don't want to get down to you know the environmental FUD type folks where they criticize us for how we use electricity. You know, you can't criticize a Bitcoiner in terms of how they want to spend their Bitcoin. Some people want to buy a ranch. Some people want to buy an apartment. Some people never want to sell, which is I'm kind of in that boat. But I certainly wouldn't prescribe this upon anyone. I know that. People have different relationship circumstances and whatnot. So when we look at Tesla, Tesla is the same thing. Like they are pretty bullish Bitcoin. I mean, it's incredible to see the comments that they've said about Bitcoin, but at the same time, they're a business. They have certain business realities that they have to face and they can't be a hardcore hodler like myself or others. Um, 
And I would very much welcome them to be as hardcore hodlers as possible. And it sounds like Elon feels that way. Elon publicly stated yesterday to El Presidente, um, El, El, El Stuhl Presidente, the yeah, Dave <laughs> um, Portnoy. yeah, Dave Portnoy. He, you know, he told him like, I haven't sold any of my Bitcoin. Now that we we didn't previously have information that uh, he himself like that Elon himself had Bitcoin, so that was actually a big revelation. Mm-hmm. Um, or re- sorry, revelation and. Yeah. <laughs> well, we don't know what he has. Uh, he did. He did admit yeah, we, once he had 0.25 of a Bitcoin, didn't he? Yeah, a few years ago, right? He's like, all I have is a buddy sent me like point something. Um, so this was Elon. Like, public, he didn't have to tweet out and correct Dave Portnoy. He decided to, and he was extremely bullish. He's like, I haven't sold anything, which definitely reflects like the core ethos is we're bullish. But this is his business, as you've mentioned, as you mentioned in the earlier part of this conversation. Tesla is a business. It is Elon's baby. Same with SpaceX. I think SpaceX for sure trumps any feelings that Elon has about money. SpaceX for him is about humanity surviving beyond this rock. And he's probably willing to sacrifice anything for that. So of course, totally understand that. And same with Tesla. I mean, Tesla is over a 10-year-old company, right? Like he plowed all of his money into Tesla and SpaceX. They even joked he had to rent, he had to borrow money to pay rent because he put all of his PayPal money into both companies. So Elon is an incredible individual, and what he's done is, I mean, he's taken on the the automobile 100-year-old industry and the military-industrial complex with rockets, and he did this, and he won. Like, he's beat them both. So yeah, for Bitcoin, I think it's an e- a, men- a means to an end. But on a personal level, it sounds like he's incredibly bullish. So yes, would we have expected Tesla to eventually sell Bitcoin at some point? Sure, I think so. I do believe his narrative of testing liquidity, though. I think for some of his board and some of the finance team, they might have been like, "This is bullshit." Like Bitcoin is, you know, it's it's a, a very it's a hyper volatile market. It's not liquid. You know, we want there might be a there might be a requirement, and I'm not in corporate finance, so this could be me just extrapolating what I think might have occurred. But they could have had been been like, "Cool, well, we want to see you go test the market in a few months and go sell." A substantial chunk and see if we can go find a counterparty for this. Is it truly a cash equivalent? And they found that it is. It's truly a cash equivalent. And there's been a lot of folks on Twitter, and I think like Hasu mentioned this, and I've I've thought about this as well, where it's like Bitcoin might be the Bitcoin, if it succeeds, will be the most liquid asset in the world, you know, in the next two to 10 years, to where it'll have the most number of counterparties to enter and exit a position. If then. If I think it succeeded, <laughs> like when do we say look, that? I, when do we say it? Look, it, it, is is this not a success now? I know it's weird to say, right? Like in the early yeah. days, Bitcoiners used to say it's either going to zero or it's going to be a lot. And now, it's never going to zero, it, dude. It, it's not going to zero. That's for sure. We don't even have to say that, but we had to say that before because we sounded like crazy people if we were like mm-hmm. just super bullish. Um, no, I certainly view it as a more likely scenario than not. I mean, hence why I've staked um, pretty much my entire net worth on it. <laughs> Me too, brother. Me too. Well, very close. So, okay, but let's talk. I just want to talk a bit more about that Tesla thing. So, one of the potential scenarios is there are plenty of other companies who've got Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Like, I don't think Sailor does. I don't think Sailor sells a penny. Just, I just don't think he does. I think he, I think he is the Pied Piper of Bitcoin right now. And he has the most diamond hands there are. And I admire what he's doing so much, but I just don't think he sells any. But I do think there are other people who might be looking towards the end of the bull market, looking to take some cash off the table. And then if we do have a cycle end, so there can be a lot of Bitcoin out there, very high price ready to sell. It's just a potential. So I see I see that as a potential if there is a trigger. I think the biggest risk is too fast and too high a run-up. I think steady growth is much better. Like, I would be really happy. I don't know about you, Dan. I'd be really happy if Bitcoin just went up like $5,000 a month, just continually, consistently. Happy days for me there. There's certainly uh, some anxiety for Bitcoiners during a bull run. It's actually kind of funny. I actually have like, during the bull run, it doesn't feel real. Uh, Whereas during the bear you know, you're kind of uh, hardened and and sharpened by the cold winter where, you know, it's uh, you, you're the rebellious few that still believe. 
But in the bull run, you're like, wait a second, <laughs> this, this is nuts. And Dogecoin's popping off oh, and things okay. are just going crazy, right? Like things are just kind of going nuts. And you're like, this doesn't even feel real. And, and then you're worried about like all sorts of structural issues. You know, I think uh, I used to be worried about stuff like that. Like, oh, what happens if we move up too fast? Or like, are we ready for this? It's the market. It's going to do what it's going to do. And we just have to like, la- you know, lock in and just ride it. You know, there's nothing, right, nothing we can really out. control about it. Yeah, I think that, um, look, for every buyer, there's a seller. And for every seller, there's a buyer. This hasn't changed throughout Bitcoin's history or any market's history since the dawn of humankind. So, you know, I find it a little bit unrealistic that we would enter a scenario where a lot of people have bought into Bitcoin, the price has gone up, and then all of a sudden, all potential buyers dry up. You know, this hasn't happened in previous cycles if there are a bunch of companies coming in, there must be a bunch of companies coming in after them. To, to think that all companies would simultaneously all decide to sell and that no one would be a bidder, especially mm-hmm. since they've been thinking about this decision for a while, they've seen the price climb up and now they're waiting for the dip. Companies might do this as well, right? Like there's always this mm-hmm. mental the mental threshold of like, let's put it this way. If Bitcoin is at $10, you would buy as much of it as you could. You, you would Dude. literally, you'd sell everything. You know, literally everything. So then, so then we do the, yeah. <laughs> then we go up another level, right? Well, if it's a hundred, you would do the same, and a thousand, and then each person has their own pr- price preference. So once Bitcoin starts to print really high, you know, values of a hundred to a million dollars of Bitcoin, so hundred thousand to a million dollars of Bitcoin, there will be bidders that start to, the 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 buy the dip bid continues to climb as well. It's not like the buy the dip bid stays at fifty thousand or stays at sixty thousand. No, the buy the dip bid increases with as the price increases, and so there's all these hidden floors of hodlers willing to buy at these certain levels, and those levels grow stronger the, the lower the price goes, and that's essentially what defines the floor of a bear market is is the aggregate belief of how low can it go. Um, but yeah, I, I find it very hard to believe that in this bull run. That all of during the bear market, there will be an increased versus the previous bear markets. There would be even more sellers than buyers in previous cycles. Um, now, of course, that's how a market goes into a bear market territory. So there are more mm-hmm. sellers than buyers. But to believe that there would be an increased uh, increased incidence of more sellers that occur in this bear market, so it would be a, a more intense bear, I find that implausible because I don't know why folks would do that. Well. Have you? Uh, I don't know if you've seen it yet. I don't know if you've been checking your phone during the night. Have you seen the rumor for this week? Uh, what's the rumor? It's, uh, Facebook have got their earnings call tomorrow. <laughs> well, rumor. we could probably look at call option pricing and see if it's been reflected in the markets. See if uh, some traders have been taking a position there. That's the rumor. That's the rumor. Is it Facebook? <laughs> I don't know. But well, okay. let's put it this way: if it is Facebook, you're going to take this clip and put it on, put it on Twitter. <laughs> Dude. Well, I, it, it, you know, the rumor's already up on Twitter, so I can't claim it. So, all right. So let's let's talk about let's go back to the super cycle. Let's talk about the reasons of why it may happen. And I've um, I've written down a few. There's a, there's a, there's a few things that have happened recently. We've obviously had. A quite significant shift in sentiment from well-known and respected investors. And Paul Tudor Jones quite early on, Stanley Druckenmiller, uh, Ray Dalio recently. I think he was at some event. He was saying people should have twenty percent of their uh, net worth in uh, Bitcoin. There was Guggenheim, um, Siskahana. Like th- there's there's it's a lot of investors coming in, but we also have corporate FOMO. We have banking FOMO. There's a lot of movement there. Um, I mean, have you seen that? I don't know if you've seen that uh, that uh, thing that went around on Twitter, for example, with the banks. It was like their old narrative and their new narrative. Like, yeah, documenting Bitcoin. Yeah. Documenting put, Bitcoin put that together. I thought that was, I actually shared that with my dad because yeah. I was like, because it's so funny, right? It's just such bullshit where a couple of years before they're just fudding the shit out of Bitcoin. And then a couple of years later, they're like, oh yeah, we're totally on board. I mean, it's a complete doublespeak. You know, it, it's complete nonsense. Um, yeah, I mean, there's certain check marks that indicate that we are in a super cycle. Um, I would say institutional buy-in and corporate buy-in is a gigantic check mark. We, I hypothesized that Bitcoin is gold 2.0 back in, in 2012, and that's why I've been hodling this whole time. The entire world, including central banks, investment banks, hedge funds, all the institutions, 
they now believe Bitcoin is gold 2.0. That's an incredible moment. These aren't a bunch of young folks at the company. These are 65-year-old dudes, 70-year-old dudes saying this. And for them to say this, Bitcoin is now being globally recognized as a gold 2.0. That's a giant check mark. That's a giant mm-hmm. check mark for the super cycle theory because now we have a new market participant, the institutions. The institutions aren't just important. This is what a lot of Bitcoiners don't realize. They're not just important because of how much money they have and how big they are in terms of like, you know, how much capital that they manage and that being deployed into Bitcoin. It's reflexive. Institutions buying Bitcoin, retail buys Bitcoin because institutions have bought Bitcoin because they still trust institutions. Mm-hmm. Remember, most people out there aren't Bitcoiners. They haven't been orange pilled. They still trust these legacy institutions. And when these legacy institutions buy Bitcoin, then they go, okay, now I'm going to buy it. And so that's where, you know, SuperCycle really comes into effect is institutions buy it. Retail goes, I should buy it because of institutions buying it. And that's a huge, huge amount of capital flowing into Bitcoin. Whereas before it was just a tiny, tiny retail market. So I think that alone is is one of the big check marks for the SuperCycle theory. Um, You know, and, and that's where I think like a lot of people just discount institutions are so like, oh, Bitcoin's going corporate. I'm like, no, this was always Bitcoin's trajectory. If you're going to become a world reserve currency, did you think we were all going to do it in our basements? <laughs> yes, in the beginning we did. But eventually it goes out and institutions adopt it and get into it. I think the the one element that is like a double check mark for me, because like the institutions, cool. Like that's gold 2.0 narrative has been bought in at the at the widest level possible. That creates reflexivity with uh, retail traders. But, you know, to, <laughs> to see corporates come in, that was a surprise to me. I actually didn't think that was going to happen. And that even wasn't really even a consideration for me. That to me is like a double check mark of like, holy shit. <laughs> if I think uh, ARK invested in an analysis where they said if 10% of all U.S. corporate treasuries were put into Bitcoin, Bitcoin's price would be $400,000 of Bitcoin. Holy That's holy. where these numbers get. Go ahead. No, no, I'm just saying holy moly. Exactly. Like, like that's where these numbers get really crazy where you're like, wait a second, how much corporate cash is there? And then they're like, whoa, there's trillions in corporate cash. And what if they start to treat Bitcoin as gold 2.0? And so there's other participants that we haven't even really thought about. And we haven't even, we haven't even had a central bank say they're buying Bitcoin yet or a Bitcoin ETF. There's all mm. of these bullish narratives that are sort of under the surface. And I've talked with Nathaniel Whitmore about this which he's, he kind of introduced me to narratives, I think, in a really deep way in the crypto world. I think that when we look at the, like, there's like the surface of narratives that we can see today. And there's also like this, all these unseen narratives to where when we look at the future narrative path of Bitcoin, there's a bunch of crazy bullish narratives that would totally change the game. A central bank buys Bitcoin. Um, $10 $10 billion plus allocation uh, to an institution or like Apple or Google or something, right? Or like, you know, there's all these super bullish narratives that we just haven't seen yet. And folks aren't really, I don't think they're pricing that in accurately of like, what happens, you know, the TLDR of the super cycle theory, what happens when the world wakes up to Bitcoin? Like, it's not going to go from the typical path, you know, where these were basically retail retail pumps, right? Which is tiny, 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 tiny. But what happens when the whole world at once comes into Bitcoin? I I think that's ultimately what the super cycle represents is like, this could be the moment where we have the education, we have the pipes ready, we have the macro backdrop, we have the micro backdrop. All of those are perfectly aligned for the potential for it to happen. Will it happen? I don't know, but it certainly looks like a possible outcome. All right, let's work through those massive uh, potential signals for change. Let's talk about let's talk about ETFs because I covered this recently with Steve McClurg and Jeff. Oh, I forgot his surname now, but I covered that recently with those those guys. And what they were saying is basically um, ETFs open up a whole new wall of liquidity coming in from pension funds, university endowments, people who can't go out and just easily buy the underlying asset, but they can buy ETS easily. Um, and I wasn't like fully aware, didn't fully understand how ETS work. So anyone who is or doesn't is the same, they should go back and listen to that episode. But talk to me about that. Talk to me why that is a, a strong signal. 
Yeah, I mean, we've seen this reflected in the GPTC arbitrage or the lack of, of arbitrage now. But with the GBTC, that's one of the only instruments you can buy to put Bitcoin in your portfolio, uh, in your traditional brokerage portfolio. So if you're just a regular old retail trader or you're an institution or you've got a 401k, IRA, um, mainly for IRAs, but I guess your company for their 401k program could could uh, enable let you allocate to GBTC. Um, you know, this is GBTC and an ETF represent ways to access Bitcoin from your traditional brokerage account, sort of like a bridge from the Bitcoin world to the regular financial world. Right now, that bridge isn't really connected with investment accounts. You essentially have a spot, so spot, so you can go buy Bitcoin at, at Kraken, Coinbase, Gemini, et cetera. But then um, that's not really connected with your traditional brokerage. So you're kind of creating like a new brokerage account. Some have like a mix, like Robinhood, for example, which I don't recommend people use because Robinhood, you can't withdraw your coins. Um, but there's, there's the, those bridges with the traditional financial world and those traditional brokerages haven't been really solidified yet. Um, also, you can't like, for example, most brokerages have 100% margin on, um, on GBTC, which means you can't borrow against it, which is kind of silly. So there's all sorts of like GBTC is kind of treated as like a very strange asset. Uh, and so an ETF would be a much more, uh, much more liquid, much more widely perceived as this is an instrument I want to own. And so that would be, I think, a really big and also validation that the SEC has christened it, right? Again, institutions buying Bitcoin legitimizes it for retail or at least a big portion of retail that still believe in, in governments and law and, and everything else. They're not all crypto they're not all crypto anarchists or uh, they're not all bitcoin uh, libertarians like we are um a lot of folks need that validation so an etf i think is a is a good validation plus the right financial instrument to unlock all this capital that's sitting in brokerage accounts okay what about talk to me about central banks buying bitcoin cuz this feels like i don't know it it feels like that that would be a massive trigger, but I feel like we're some way off that. I, I, I don't know. I just, that's a massive step for a central bank to consider buying Bitcoin because, I mean, it's positive in so many ways for Bitcoin, but it's negative in so many ways for their own currency. Yeah, I don't think it'd be a major central bank. When I say central bank, I don't think that's going to be the Fed. I don't think it's going to be um, ECB. I don't think that's going to be, you know, any sort of central bank out. The major central bank could be more of like a, um, like an individual country that's not exactly that big. Um, there could also be an angle of Russia or China doing it as a geopolitical maneuver. Um, what's interesting about this is that it doesn't actually require a central bank to buy Bitcoin. All that people need to do is think that a bank bought Bitcoin. <laughs> it's, uh, there's, there's no way to defeat the narrative once it's been propagated. And if the narrative is widely believed by uh, market participants, then essentially it has already occurred, even if it hasn't. Um, you know, that's where I think we see in the hyper bullish part of the bull run, there's going to be rumors like this that circulate. It's just, it's inevitable, right? Just like the rumors. You know, what's funny is the Tesla rumor actually came out pretty in December. Um, I heard through my network about Tesla buying Bitcoin, which was kind of wild. Um, so rumors like that, you know, will, will propagate whether they're true or not. But certainly a central bank buying Bitcoin rumor will propagate at the peak of this bull run, whether or not it's real is somewhat immaterial because if the other central banks believe that a central bank is buying it, then there's this reflexivity of like, well, I need to get ahead of this. And if I buy it ahead of someone else, if I could front run their trade. So it, it will, is there a possibility that central banks buying Bitcoin is a narrative and that it will be widely believed? Absolutely. And given that that is going to happen, then that will kickstart central banks buying Bitcoin. It's kind of a weird, weird thinking mm. through it of that, like essentially just because it's, it's out there and being thought about makes it happen uh, because market participants are trying to constantly reprice ahead of other individuals and central banks will go, well, if they're doing it, then I should maybe do it. Like if, for example, yeah. if there was a leak that like the fed was buying Bitcoin, other central banks would be like, well, shit, <laughs> we, we don't know if they are or not, but now we have to think about if they did and if they did, then what should we do? And then go, you go down the rabbit hole. Yeah, um, so I've I've covered this a few times before, and uh, and I've got a few points on this. Uh, and anyone listening, apologies if I'm repeating myself. But when MicroStrategy originally bought a few hundred million dollars of Bitcoin, 
and if we were at about at about eleven thousand dollars, a lot of people thought they were crazy. I was even like, "Who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> What's he doing?" That's cool, but seems a bit crazy. Like it just did, and now everybody wishes they were the micro strategy of Bitcoin because they were the first to do it in a big way. And in some ways, there is an incentive to be the first central bank, to be the, the first central bank. Yeah, the micro strategy of central banks that to be that first one in. But the difference is like I I I see, I totally see Michael Saylor's strategy of encouraging others to consider it in the same way. Yeah, financially he's incentivized, perhaps, perhaps philosophically is, but definitely financially he's incentivized to tell others. Um, but with a central bank, I don't know if they're financially incentivized to come and announce to the market in the same way because that is, that essentially is if they believe that they need Bitcoin, why would they ever want to push the price up? They would just want to constantly accumulate as they can. Yeah, that's where we wouldn't see them disclose it until they have a substantial position. Yeah. They're not going to disclose that to the market because as soon as they do, it's going to pump. And they probably buy call options as well at the same time and, and try to <laughs> juice all the return they can out of it. I mean, <laughs> um, but that's where what, what's interesting is that like China and Russia know that they will never be a world reserve currency. No one trusts them. Like, mm -hmm. look, I'm not exactly like a bleeding heart, like, oh, America's perfect. We've got a bunch of flaws too. Let's put it this way. In the global economy, no one trusts China. <laughs> no one trusts Russia at all. Zero. Like, they might have aspirations of being like China, especially China being a world reserve currency. That ain't going to happen. There's no, no fucking way. Um, this, <laughs> the world does not trust them. And so what's their next best alternative? Because they don't like the United States. They don't like Europe. What's their next best alternative? You buy Bitcoin and you're like, well... It's it's a simple you know it's a simple game theory of going well if I, I if I can't be the world reserve currency and the people are losing faith in the existing one and there's this thing called Bitcoin well then I might as well hop on the bandwagon sooner than later and just jump on board and I think that's that's the most likely scenario is like a China or Russia I think buying Bitcoin them going look this is our way to to get an edge over America where America is still believing in this dollar world. Uh, where, and by the way, I hope the United States leads the forefront and leads the charge into central banks buying Bitcoin. Like, I don't wish this upon America. I don't wish this upon um, any of these Western developed countries. I don't, I don't want this circumstance to happen. But just given the kind of arrogance of the dollar system, I find it hard for them to come to this conclusion faster than it would be for others who have, who have to exist outside of the dollar system or who exist as, you know, uh, essentially they're stuck with the dollar system. They're going to come to this realization before folks who've totally bought into the dollar do. Well, it's not going to be the morons in my government. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hostile environment they've created for Bitcoin in in uh, in the UK. God, I, I, do you know what, Dan? Um, and it's are you guys, you guys allowed to have uh, are you guys allowed to have like cutting knives to like cut your cut your vegetables with, or we're do you allowed, have to ask for that? No, we're allowed to have cutting knives, um, and that, that we're okay with that. Although, look, I mean, that's a whole other conversation. I actually, I'm not. <laughs> if I want to, I want a gun when I'm in America, and I don't want a gun when I'm in the UK. Uh, but we are, um, we are opening up. I'm not sure if we're illegal. I'm not sure if we're legally allowed to hug people yet. I hugged, I hugged someone a few days ago, <laughs> but I, I don't even know if I broke the law. Um, I, I think we might need a permission slip for hugs. Need to find that out. Uh, but I definitely okay. need to get out of this place. It's going yeah, to shit. Yeah, how, how do you get? You guys are fined if you leave the UK, right? Depends. You are allowed to leave because I've been figuring this out. You're allowed to leave for work reasons, and you have to have a, a solid work reason. Mine, mine fits the bill. I'm allowed to leave. Uh, but what was happening? Influencers were leaving and going to Dubai. And and taking photos of themselves in Dubai and coming back, they don't get away with that. Um, but if you've got a solid reason, like the piece of business you need to do can't be done from the UK, you can leave. Um, I think it's going to change soon. Anyway, we, we we've um, we've vaccinated half the country, but I mean, whatever. We're going off a tangent. We could talk about this another time. But it's becoming <laughs> more and more evident that we have to leave. I do want to go back uh, back to this. Uh, one of the weird scenarios about central banks adopting Bitcoin, and I'm just trying to think of an example country. Imagine it was 
Turkey or Nigeria. They say, actually, do you know what? We need to do this. The fastest way they can accumulate Bitcoin is they can print their own currency. uh, And it's a speculative attack on their own currency. So they will end up destroying the value of the citizens' savings by inflating their own currency to go out on the market and buy Bitcoin. And it becomes a weird scenario where they potentially have to look at the trade-offs for holding Bitcoin. Yeah, I think um, that's where people are like, oh, a million dollars of Bitcoin, that seems crazy. I'm like, I don't think we've even approached, I don't even think a million dollars of Bitcoin is crazy, like eventually. And, the, and by the way, I'm talking in today's dollars too. I'm not talking about in a future inflated dollar state where tons of dollars have been printed, even more so. I'm talking about current purchasing value of a million. What, yeah, what happens when <laughs> tens of trillions of dollars from these governments, what if they start to buy with, you know, they start to print and buy? Um, you know, and, and remember that it's not like a... It's not like a linear relationship, like a trillion dollars doesn't come into Bitcoin and Bitcoin moves up a trillion. A trillion dollars comes into Bitcoin and Bitcoin moves up to 20 trillion. You know, like that's where I do believe that some of these super bullish long-term estimates for Bitcoin, like uh, Hal Finney's original estimate that Bitcoin might be worth $10 million of Bitcoin. I think in the long term, that's not too crazy to think about if all the central banks FOMO in. Like if Bitcoin truly becomes a world reserve currency. That's like a very long-term, very, very bullish scenario. But that's where in this, this, this current cycle, what happens if we see a couple of central banks do that and we see the narrative propagate? It doesn't mean it's true or not, but the narrative propagate that a major central bank bought it. Again, you can't kill the rumor. There's no way to kill it. Even if you show your reserve balances, no one will believe you. No one will believe the central bank. There's no trust in central banks. Um, they've also done really shady things during 2008. And during COVID, where they actually in in the United States, there had a, there was a Freedom of Information Act disclosure that they forced with the Fed to disclose certain uh, kind of like shadow banking that they set up for these institutions during the 2008 financial crisis. So you can't stop the rumor. That's what's so wild about this is it's kind of like a virus, and it's all this virus of like everyone thinking about well, does this other counterparty believe in Bitcoin too? That's what I think is so wild about this is like there's no real way to stop it. There's no way to and, – and will this narrative propagate and will it, will it sink in and become a realization? Will the market price this in? I think so. And that's where it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy of like the market goes higher on that rumor. Other central banks think, oh, maybe I should buy it because this central bank did. And then they buy it and then, they, and then the central bank that was rumored to do it goes, oh, shit, all the other central banks are buying it. And that's, that's how it all flows. Things could get a bit weird though. It could get really difficult in terms of pricing things if multiple speculative attacks are happening. Um, And I don't know if I'm being hyperbolic imagining this scenario could happen, but we are seeing some weird kind of inflation and shrinkflation things happening. A lot of people talking about the price of lumber. I mean, I I don't know what this means, but somebody tweeted earlier, $7 for a 2 by 4 Apparently that's very expensive. I don't know because I don't buy uh, lumber. But we could see all kinds of weird pricing all over the place. Uh, I do get mildly concerned about that kind of scenario, the impact that will have on people and that kind of rep- repricing event. Yeah, I mean, I um, I certainly, you know, it's kind of funny. There's some moments of, of thinking like, it would be nice if we could all trust each other and then we wouldn't need systems like this. You know, it's it'd be nice if that that world existed, but that's not the reality that we live in. That's just human nature, and that's not a bad or good thing. That just is what it is. So with these market events, I don't view it as negative or positive. A, bear, a, a depression or a recession is not a bad thing. It just is what it is. It's, it is a, in a, you know, in a, a bull market isn't a bad or good thing. It, it just is what it is. I mean, this is just the universe doesn't care if the markets went down or up. You know, we, it's just how things are priced. It's pricing. It's about the information and value flowing through the system, and simply these are these are ways that humans describe certain environments where there's been a mal mal allocation of risk and reward, and that that turns into like a bear market or a, a you know recession. And so I don't you know for me I don't really I'm not particularly worried about Bitcoin leading to an environment where there's a lot of repricing, there's a lot of volatility due to like Bitcoin shaking the world up. 
It's not Bitcoin's fault. The world was already that way. Bitcoin just kind of made it happen. Um, and that's where, you know, I think I think Bitcoin will be blamed in the future for like a recession. And the people, people will be like, oh, it was Bitcoin's fault when in reality it was all these central banks' fault and all these governments' faults. Um, Bitcoin just came in and it was the antidote. And if people want, go, went to, I want the antidote to this bad central banking policy, they bought it. And that caused people to exit the existing system, which causes that those prices to go down and Bitcoin's price to go up. I saw a really good tweet earlier today, I think it's today or yesterday, <clears throat> where somebody said, if Bitcoin didn't have a price, 99% of the people complaining about it wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I mean, most of the people who don't like Bitcoin just dislike it because they're on the wrong side of the trade. They uh, Do they really care about energy? No, of course not. Because if they were at all a shred of intellectual design, uh, of honesty, they would evaluate the existing financial system. And then they would compare Bitcoin to it and go, both systems use a lot of energy. And that's where you realize it's not really about these FUD arguments that are like legitimate or not. It's, it's they just don't like Bitcoin. And they're coming up with a, a, a myriad of narratives to try to FUD Bitcoin. Quantum computing, uh, energy FUD, governments banning it FUD. It's basically they're on the wrong side of the trade and they're just coming up with narratives to make themselves feel better. There's some, there's some real good momentum behind countering the energy FUD. It's a really good, interesting narrative. Nick Carter, obviously, we know has been doing some great work. Uh, there's the work that's been happening. Is it Square have been doing some research work? There's a lot of good work going on to counter that now. People don't want to accept it, but it's certainly happening. Yeah, certainly. I think um, Nick Carter and I have both worked on anti-energy FUD narratives. Nick Carter, I think, has carried the torch now in terms of he's really out there. He's He's got so much energy to go fight it, <laughs> all puns intended, you know, like... He, he, I think he's our champion. He's our champion to fight energy FUD. Um, and the energy FUD narrative, the the counter narrative has gotten really strong. Like I worked on proof of work as efficient back in 2018. And that was sort of like the gold standard for energy FUD fighting. And there's been iterations on that. And I think Nick's iteration and the modern iteration is the is the most compressed narrative possible. And also the best. It's It's essentially your numbers, like you come and FUD Bitcoin, First of all, your metrics are wrong. How you think about it's wrong, which indicates that you have great intellectual dishonesty. Um, and then we go further and we're like, wait a second. So why don't you compare this to the existing financial system? Like, why don't you criticize the existing financial system? And if they don't do that, they're dishonest. There's no mm -hmm. other way to slice. Like, there's no other way to slice it. If you don't criticize the existing financial system's energy consumption, you are completely dishonest. And so, you can just easily pick apart the argument where you're like, well, how about the existing financial system? Or how about your Xbox usage? You know, like, <laughs> but they haven't done the work. Yeah, and this is where, in uh, when I came up with uh, electricity police back in 2019, <laughs> you know, that you don't fight <laughs> FUD police. by pro providing logical arguments that refute directly the FUD. You have to go to the core root of the idea, and the core root is that Bitcoin isn't doing anything useful. That's why these critics don't like it. They don't like Bitcoin. They think any energy usage is terrible for the economy, and so what you do is you attack that. You go right at it and you go, well, did you audit the existing financial system? No, that's completely dishonest then. Or you're like, wait a second, so why is Bitcoin's energy consumption bad, but Xbox electricity consumption is good? And of course, there's no counter for that. And so you then undermine the core argument that they have, which is that you know, they essentially believe that they have the right to monitor, police, audit, and basically... Um, basically, <laughs> they believe that they're allowed to police everyone's electricity usage for every usage of electricity, which is absurd. You know, like mm -hmm. I always like to counter, I'm like, it would be great if we started with an audit of your existing energy usage. I'd love to know your browsing Ooh. behavior, what TV shows you watch. Let's let's start with that. If you want to like look at us critically, let's look at you first. Um, what car do you drive? Do you take airline flights or do you take a boat? Um, how many cars do you own? What what size house do you have? Like you go down mm -hmm. this rabbit hole, I mean, I'm not going to go justify my square footage to you. I'm going to buy my fucking house. <laughs> do you know what? Do you like, know what? Ma yeah. Marty Bent called me out on this once, and he was right. He was fucking right. I was having a good old whinge about global warming stuff because because uh, I I do. I used to do that. <laughs> and he was like, yeah, but didn't you take 92 flights last year? And I was like, oh, like getting a bit triggered. And I was like, fuck, you were right. Like, who am I to judge when I'm a fucking And ultimately, that's... Yeah. Ultimately, that's what it's about, right? Like, 
Mm. Did you sit in a, did you sit in first class or did you, who cares? I mean, you can't you can't go down the rabbit hole. Even like someone's like, oh well, did you eat a steak versus vegetables? One used more or less electricity. Who gives a shit? <laughs> you know, like, I mean, who wants to live in a world like that where we have to constantly? And, and by the way, we live in a world of energy. Per the laws of thermodynamics, the entire universe is just energy. Energy mm-hmm. consumption is inherent to living. Inherently, and, and then if we go down that path, inherently energy consumption is around living a high standard of living. You can live in the middle of nowhere, wash your clothes by hand, have no dishwasher, no electricity, and do you l- use a lot of energy? No. But you live you like a smell like shit, fucking like animal. Yeah you, yeah, you live like an animal. And the whole reason why we like to take an airplane is because we go a lot faster than walking. <laughs> um, and But then if you walked at all, you probably used more energy than the flight because you'd have to consume calories to keep walking. And that's energy. So, you know, I think that, um, I think that that's such kind of a bizarre thinking uh, that, you know, energy consumption is this terrible thing and well, let's audit Bitcoin first. Yeah. All right, man. Well, listen, just conscious of time. I know it's really early for you there. It's uh, afternoon for me here. Uh, you've got another article coming out, an update. By the way, I've been loving your content research. Actually, ever since you started writing, people should... I'll put a link in the show notes so people can go and check your shit out. But what's what's coming up in this article? This is, I mean, it's why we're talking, because I, I wanted the early exclusive. Yeah, so I write a weekly newsletter called The Held Report. It's my intimate thoughts about Bitcoin once a week. I cover things like proof of work versus proof of stake. Energy FUD, all these sort of topics. This week's topic is is touching on what we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, What are the signals that we're in a super cycle? What are some metrics? What are some numbers? What are some qualitative reasons why we should be in one? It's it's revisiting my super cycle theory from 2019. All right, cool. Well, I will definitely check that out, my man. Uh, Hopefully, I'm going to see you in around four weeks, four and a half weeks. We're going to get some whiskey in. Bitcoin Miami, man, it's going to be fun. I, uh, I don't. I think everyone's going. I think it's going to be a little bit of a crazy time. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, though. I think a lot of Bitcoiners have been missing each other. Mm-hmm. We usually go hang out at conferences, so I've I've been missing missing our whiskeys and beers. Yeah, man. Well, we will do it hopefully in about four and a half weeks, as long as I have no travel hiccups, man. Honestly, I'm going to tell you about the shit I'm having to go through to get there. It's Aren't, like I, I really took for granted how easy travel was before. The the absolute hoops I've got to jump through to get there. I'll tell you about when I see you, man. But listen, look, love you, dude. Love everything you're doing. I'll stick a link in the show notes. And yeah, hopefully we'll have a beer in about four weeks. Sounds good, man. First beer's on right, me. <laughs> Definitely. Cheers. 